Um, so when we're talking about protecting our user accounts, we're typically talking about a couple of different aspects. So um, uh, as we mentioned in our introduction, multi-factor authentication or MFA is, is probably the key one um, in, in order to get up and running uh, very efficiently and effectively. Um, that ties in with uh, conditional access. So if you um, haven't got conditional access in place, then uh, it's something you should definitely look into. Um, uh, I also talk about the, the notion of um, guest users and external users, which is um, something obviously in today's day and age, um, or today's society, that um, many people are working from home and will continue to work from home for a period of time. So understanding those guests and external users within your tenant um, might be um, something that needs to be looked at. Um, and then I'll also have a, a demo and a discussion around risky users and risky sign-ins, um, which is kind of the key in understanding all the things throughout um, your identity protection space. Um, so what are, the, what are the types of MFA? So um, uh, we mentioned earlier before that there was um, token-based MFA, um, uh, authentication application um, MFA, um, but basically from a Microsoft standpoint, um, they, they're really pushing the fact that the, the Microsoft authentication app is the key um, between activating all of your MFA. Uh, it allows push notifications and easy approval for you to go in and approve your, um, your access. So if we have a look up here, this is the first step. You put in your username and password. That was the most common way of actually getting in and logging into your account. Um, what multi-factor authentication does is it allows that second layer to basically secure your identity further. Um, through, through the Microsoft means, um, the ways that that can be done is through the authentication app, um, through a text or through a call. Um, so I just noticed that there is a question. Um, so what happens if we have um, staff who um, MFA can't be activated for? So they don't have a mobile device or they will not secure their BYOD under an MDM policy um, or they won't place M MFA on their mobile. Um, so. M MFA is reliant on having an additional aspect to the user account. So unfortunately, MFA does need some kind of additional function that will actually um, authenticate against the user account. This is why um, the authentication process is important. It, there needs to be some kind of correlation between the user and another thing that will actually make them um, uh, approved through the MFA um, process. So, um, um, which leads me on to my next um, category of, of security around identity, and that's conditional access. Now, conditional access is an ever evolving topic. Um, uh, it starts with understanding um, the user and their devices and their apps and where they are and all the different access points that they can go through. It then goes through a verification of understanding what, um, uh, what can actually be achieved through the conditional access policy, and then that will obviously lead into access. So when it comes to um, conditional access, there's varying different uh, policies and implementations you can put in place. Um, a lot of them can be um, to protect around uh, the, where the user is located, or um, uh, whether the device is enrolled into the tenant, or um, whether they reach a, a certain um, capacity of conditional access policy. So um, I'll, I'm going to jump to my next slide and I might come back to it, but in jumping to the next slide, I'm gonna um, raise a bit of a poll to get a bit of an understanding of um, some of the different types of conditional access policies that can be put in place or recommendations that could be put in place, um, in which case uh, I want you to actually check off multiple if you have them implemented or if you don't have them imp implemented uh, because it's, it's multifaceted. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to explain each individual one at that point. So um, 
Um, so uh, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, guests and external users and in doing so I've brought up a little bit of a flowchart in how that operates with Azure Identity Protection. So obviously we start with Azure AD. Um, if that guest or external user is not within that tenant, then the, the, the authentication will de be declined. Um, People can invite guests and external users, um, and when they do, that will then move into um, a different process. So I, I've, um, I've done this in regards to Teams, uh, Teams being a, a, a product that is very um, utilized right now in the global scenario, as well as the fact that it interlinks all the underlying products together um, so that um, when, when it does have an authentication and the user does exist within the tenant, it then goes and has a look at the Teams um, based settings. So if Teams is not configured to allow guests and external users, then the, the process of being able to get the access to those, that data is going to disable then and there. Um, and then when it moves on and understands, yes, Teams is actually configured correctly with the external users, um, then it will move on to um, understanding the auth auth authentication of that guest itself. So does then SharePoint allow the external sharing? Does the user belong to a group that allows the permissions? And does that group allow external access? Um, can the user access the specific application? So there's a whole layer of process that comes along with your guests and external users that I just wanted to point out can be utilized to allow guests and external users within your tenant, but you can keep that level of security across the board with some implementations of conditional access, MFA, of the different aspects that you can apply at the different products here as well. So risky sign-in. So Underlyingly, when a user signs into a tenant, there is a risky sign-in um, process. So um, it gets the information that is about that user and it places it kind of into a, a scoring category about where that user is located, what the user's IP is, the consistency of that user logging into that area or that IP, um, and kind of ties them all together in giving an understanding on how to detect risk with your sign-ins. So uh, risky sign-in works in a methodology that, hey, you might accidentally type your password incorrectly or you might decline an MFA prompt or you might not actually um, prompt your MFA and you might actually f miss time it or whatever it might be and that might flag it as one risky sign-in. Um, it will then go ahead and, and wait and see what the next um, event will happen and when they're all kind of put together it gives you an understanding of that user um, which ties into risky users. So um, authentication factors um, give some context around the sign in itself. Um, it will allow you to make choices at different levels of those risky users or risky sign-ins, um, which I'll go through in the demo next. Um, and then you can make a manual review of each of the different types of risky sign-ins or risky users that you have to basically block that user from being signed in or um, uh, restrict them from certain access. Um, but basically, have an evaluation of your sign-ins at the identity level and then be able to make um, educated um, decisions around how you handle those sign-ins. So the, the key part about risky sign-ins is the conditions. So um, when a user goes to log in, um, the conditions that are, that are here will kind of go through and understand whether that user is able to meet the conditions to access um, whether it's an app application, whether it's the, the user signing into an office, office product itself um, as MFA is configured in that means. Um, but basically it will go through a bit of a checklist and go what application is it logging into, who's the user or group, what's the location, whether it's an IP or an actual physical country location, what's the device, st device state that they're signing in with, so is their device enrolled, if it is enrolled does it meet a certain level of policy, um, if it doesn't then it might not meet the condition, um, and then kind of 
get a bit of an understanding of what the sign-in risk is based on all of those factors. Um, and when basically it spits it out, like if, if anyone's ever used um, Active Directory in the past, it spits it out a bit like an event log, which I'll show you in the demo, which you can kind of delve in and have a look at the different attributes that exist um, for uh, risky sign-ins, which then leads into um, the risky users. So uh, I'm just gonna get a demo set up, cool. So we'll just start off with a demo now. Um, so uh, when you go into your tenant, you're gonna want to go into the identity protection blade within Azure Active Directory. So you would go into um, your Azure portal and you'd go to the identity protection uh, blade. And once we're there, we're gonna pause. Um, I'm just going to um, explain what the dashboard looks like. So you can see right here that these are the new risky users and down the bottom are the new risky sign-ins. So um, basically what happens is um, the information that comes in through identity protection will feed into this dashboard and it will show um, the number of risky users and risky sign-ins. Um, and then basically you can do a historical, whether it's seven days, 30 days or 90 days, um, you can have a look at the different levels of risk. So one of the factors that I'm going to be going in further with the um, uh, risky users is actually implementing a policy against a risky user and implementing a policy against a risky sign-in. And they're related to the level of risk that Microsoft deems. So there's, there's three levels of risk. It's low, medium, and high. Um, and then you can apply a policy at those certain levels so that, hey, you might have a risky sign-in and then that person is required to actually use MFA if it's deemed to be risky. So those metrics are um, underlyingly pinned by Microsoft. They're able to go in there and, and um, make changes and developments based on the products that they're releasing at the time. And they kind of all interlink with each other. So they look at all those conditions that I spoke about previously, and then they go, okay, is that user deemed at a risk? And if it is a risk, is it a low, medium, or high risk? Um, that's essentially what identity protection does at its core base um, in conjunction with conditional access, in conjunction with MFA, in conjunction with guest and external users. Um, so there's a, there's a few things to note here. You can see that there is some information about the secure score, which Bilal spoke about earlier. So you can go in and actually get your identity level of the secure score at this plane. Um, if you click on that, it will actually take you to the secure score and it'll tell you which things you need to implement to improve your score. Um, and uh, I think we can continue on with the demo. So, I'm gonna go through and just create a user risk policy. So as we're going through here, we're going to um, assign um, a, a group or, or, or all users. Um, and basically all I'm doing for this demo is I'm gonna uh, exclude the admin account that I'm actually using, just to kind of give you an idea of how to set up the policy in itself. Uh, obviously in real conditions, you wouldn't want to do this, but um, the condition, and we'll just pause it here, so as I was discussing earlier, um, you're able to set conditions against the low, medium and high risk that is set out uh, within the Microsoft metrics. Um, and in doing so, you're able to apply a response if that condition is met. So um, for a risky user, we're going to set it as medium and above. So any event that is deemed to be a medium and, and above risk is going to be evaluated and then a condition is going to happen as of, um, after that fact. So if we can continue on with the demo, um, medium and above get selected. And what, what we're gonna do at the risky users level is we're gonna require them um, to implement MFA. Oh, sorry, require them to do a password change. Um, so risky users um, uh, is kind of like the second level to the risky sign-ins. So it's more of an impact, and I'll just pause it there. Um, we just want to make sure that um, as we implement things, um, we want to enforce it. But uh, a risky user is the second level to risky sign-ins. So a couple of risky sign-ins could lead to a user being deemed as risky. So I would um, put in a 
second level of control that you would want to do in regard to the risky users. The recommendation is that if a user is deemed to be a risky user, then you would request them to change their password. In doing so, it would probably prompt them to do MFA as well, um, but it's all kind of protecting yourself um, and your users uh, in this means. So make sure that policy gets enforced uh, and then we'll, we'll move on to creating a, a user, uh, sorry, a risky sign-in policy as well. So if we can continue the demo, the policy has been successfully saved uh, and then we'll move in to do a, a sign-in risk. So in a similar fashion, you can apply it to groups or several groups, all your users. You can exclude who you want to exclude. Um, if you're getting too much um, events occurring because of certain means, then you can have exceptions. So again, we're going to um, go through and do a, a medium and above um, risk and um, for, and just pause it there. Um, so uh, you can see there, so instead of doing a password change for a risky sign-in, the control will be that we implement multi-factor authentication. So what will happen is that once a, uh, a risky sign-in is detected, um, Microsoft uh, will deem it to be a low, medium or high level. If it's a medium and, a, or, and or above, then it will prompt the user to use MFA. Now what that does is it just adds that level of security to prevent um, those unknown malicious people that we spoke about in the introduction to be able to make sure that the identity is confirmed that that person is that person that they are saying they are um, rather than having any other problems that exist with the risky users and risky sign-ins. And that is all tied in conjunction with your conditional access policies as well as your factor authentication policies. Um, so we'll enforce that policy. Um, we'll continue on, make sure that that um, policy gets enforced and it's been successfully saved. Um, I just want to show you that there's an MFA um, policy as well, so you can um, have a MFA registration policy in place as well uh, within the same blade. Um, and then there's some reports, so I'm not going to save those changes. We'll just give you a quick look at the reports. Um, so this is a risky user, so I'm just going to pause it there. So this uh, user is deemed to be at risk and the risk level is high and at the bottom you, you can get some of that information that gets gathered um, when a sign-in actually occurs. So you can see the user, what the role they have. So you might have conditional access against the certain roles that you have within your environment. Um, you can see um, the office location, um, the mobile number, etc. So uh, I'll just let that demo play through a bit more. Um, you can actually go in and have a look at the recent risky sign-ins. So if there's multiple risky sign-ins, so you can see that there was an interrupted sign-in rather than uh, uh, successful, and that may have been why it deemed it as at risk. And so once that user is deemed at risk with that sign-in, um, you can dismiss that risk, um, you can block that user, you can investigate with ATP, go in and do all these conditional things. So we're just going to dismiss the risk at this point because we understand what that user's um, situation was. It might have been that they logged in via VPN um, on the off chance or it might have been that they were in another country or whatever it might be. Um, and in the same vein, we're just going to go in and confirm the sign-ins um, within the risky sign-ins themselves. So I'll just pause it there. Um, so the risky sign-ins kind of underpin the risky user. So you've got the, the risky users um, that kind of gets, uh, I guess, presented after a couple of factors that have happened with their sign-in process. So here you'll see that the sign-in process has occurred in a specific area, um, on the, a, a browser, on an operating system, and it's deemed it to be a medium or high risk likely because it's trying to log in in some country or location that I can't really uh, comprehend where it is. Um, but um, it might see a pattern that that user hadn't actually signed in ever at that location. So it might deem it a risky sign in. Um, and so if we continue with the demo then, um, so we've just approved and confirmed that those sign ins are safe. Um, and then there's some risky detections as well. So the detection type will give you an under understanding of why it was deemed. So whether it was a, a travel or 
um, whether it was an unfamiliar sign-in process, it'll give you a bit more clarity and a bit more information in this blade um, to be able to go in and determine um, the, the location sign-in. So it might detect it that it's in one IP and then it's used a VPN and gone to another. Um, this area here allows you to have, um, and I'll just pause it, it allows you to set up some notifications. So within your tenant, it might be that you have uh, a managed service provider um, that you want to send these alerts to, then um, uh, in preview, you can actually now put in a distribution list to send it to those um, specific users that you want to inform of a risky sign-in, um, or internally, you can um, just add in your users manually if you click that included um, spot right there, then you can add your users in one by one and you can change the alert level. So you might want it to only show high risk because that's what you deem necessary within your environment for users. Um, and then uh, there's also, if we go on with the demo, um, there's also like a weekly digest. So in the same vein, um, an email will get sent out uh, at the moment that's only internally, but you're able to send out an email that kind of explains uh, what has happened for the for the week. So you can get an understanding of all your risky sign-ins, all your risky users, uh, and start maybe implementing other conditional access policies um, that could assist with reducing the amount of um, risk that is in your environment. Um, but all these aspects kind of tie together with identity protection, and uh, that kind of all, they kind of intertwine with each other. So your conditional access policies are tied with MFA. MFA is tied to the user. Um, MFA is also tied to devices as well as conditional access. Um, it, de it depends whether the user is a guest user or an external user. It, it's determined whether the user is a risky user or has gone through a period of risky sign-ins. There's all these different factors that kind of all come together when you're looking at the user perspective. Um, as, as outlined within um, the Microsoft uh, Zero Trust environment, the identity is kind of like who you are. So it's the, the core of what they look at first and foremost. Um, and with that, I think um, that's it from protecting user accounts. So if we just skip to the next slide. Uh, so I, I'll just quickly go through some of the recent updates. So uh, obviously, uh, with risky sign-ins, um, there's always going to be additional detection methods. Um, there's also going to be additional ap um, applications and options you can put into your conditional access. Um, uh, they have suspicious inbox manipulation in preview, which should be coming out soon. Um, impossible travel is also in preview, so it'll determine whether it's impossible for someone to go from one location to another and sign in at that same location, although um, based on Yoni's driving, that might be a, a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, and then uh, some recent updates with the reporting blade as well. So.